Uh, I'll start by introducing the entire panel at once. So David Hyman is the H. Ross and Helen Workman Chair in Law and the Director of the Epstein Program in Health Law and Policy at the University of College Law. Mark D. White is Professor and Chair of the Department of Philosophy, College of Staten Island at CUNY. And Andrea Freeman is Assistant Professor of Law, University of Hawaii at Manoa William S. Richardson School of Law. And this is the panel on potential problems and limits of nudges in healthcare. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for including me in this. Thank you for putting together such an excellent uh, conference, uh, so well organized. Uh, thank you for putting the salad at the beginning of the lunch table. Um, I'm from Chicago where we like deep dish pizza, and so why are you all hating on pizza? What's wrong with pizza? <laughs> um, so uh, my co-author Tom Eulen was originally supposed to present. He asked me to give you his apologies, uh, unavoidable uh, other commitment uh, that came up at the last minute. He also asked me to tell you uh, that anything that's snarky in here is attributable to me. Um, he's the soul of compassion and gentleness on these <laughs> issues. Um, so. Uh, we, we have a, a relatively short paper, uh, somewhat speculative, uh, asking the question, uh, what can we learn about uh, behavioral law and economics from PAPACA, which is what I persist in calling it, uh, despite everyone's attempt to use something else. Uh, obviously, the Patient Protection uh, and Affordable Care Act. Uh, you could also run it the other direction and ask um, uh, what you can learn in, uh, in the other way. But let's focus on this one. Uh, the, the, I think morning session sort of laid out this pretty effectively. Uh, choice architecture, or nudges or defaults uh, often work quite well. Uh, the standard example uh, is you compare organ uh, donation sign-up rates and organ donation rates in countries that have opt-in versus opt-out. Uh, you see quite different rates. Uh, anybody who's ever gotten a rebate uh, or a coupon uh, and hasn't filled it out uh, versus getting the upfront money at a direct uh, point of purchase discount knows exactly what I'm talking about. There are lots of other examples. So often they work well, they work seamlessly, they work uh, in the background, uh, unless they don't. Um, and so uh, two uh, recent articles that sort of make this point and uh, we've collected uh, some specific examples. So overdraft protection, uh, we basically flipped the default in 2010 uh, you no longer have overdraft protection unless you explicitly opt in. Uh, and then it turns out uh, the banks pretty aggressively marketed overdraft protection and a significant chunk of people opted in. So the default turned out to be slippery rather than sticky. Um, and you can see some of the other examples here. Automatic enrollment uh, and defined contribution. I think there's uh, a very a first rate literature on the impact of this. Uh, it turns out it actually has a real impact except if you set the uh, default savings rate too high, people seem to opt out entirely. Uh, and there's at least interesting questions about the distributional impact uh, of the default on people who would have selected a higher rate had there not been a default for them to operate under. Uh, and Cass actually has uh, in his book this sort of interesting example of whether you change your last name after you get married for people in my parents' generation. The answer was straightforward. The men kept their name and the women adopted their husband's name. Uh, for my generation and younger generations, men still don't change their names, uh, but women to an increasing degree uh, seem to keep their names as well. So the interesting question there is what makes that sticky some of the time and slippery other times, uh, and to what extent can one move it from one status to another? Uh, there are a couple of other issues as well, right? We've tended to view uh, choice architecture today and nudging is entirely benign, low cost, low risk. Of course, the problem is the people who are designing the choices, particularly government, uh, as Cass, I think, properly pointed out, have their own informational deficiencies and biases. Uh, and uh, this is just a quote from Richard Epstein that uh, it's easy to think that collective responses are preferred when markets are corrupt and governments are virtuous. I'm here to tell you there are problems with both sides. <laughs> Uh, and self-interest and corruption creates difficulties from both quarters. Uh, the other issue that we flag in the paper is, is it really meaningful to speak of a failed nudge? And if we can identify the certain nudges or think about nudges not working, are we really talking about nudges then? Or is it just 
a marketing move to avoid over paternalism, and then we retool it when it doesn't work. Uh, and if you hang out with public health people, um, they're only using nudges because they can't get the power to do paternalism. And they've got a long list of things they'd like to do to the rest of us. Um, and they're convinced that they're good for us, uh, and there's certainly some empirical evidence to back them up. Um, but in their view, prohibition was a failure because it didn't go far enough. Uh, so that ought to give you the willies. Um, so the focus of our paper is actually to look at specific provisions in PAPACA uh, that we think are structured as nudges that relate to coverage. Uh, the exchanges are a two-level opt-in. States decide whether or not to have an exchange. Individuals decide whether to enroll in an exchange or not. Uh, the Medicaid expansion effectively structures the same way uh, because of the Supreme Court's opinion. It was effectively a one-stage opt-in uh, pre-NFIB. Uh, and some states actually did auto-enrollment for a significant chunk of the population uh, if they had already taken steps to cover them uh, in the new expanded Medicaid program. CLASS was a, a two-level uh, program as well. Employers decided whether to enroll uh, as did individuals, and if your employer decided it you could opt out, but you were otherwise automatically enrolled. Uh, the employer mandate uh, sort of works that way as well, uh, particularly, especially, well, I should say only for employers with more than 200 employees. And then the last issue is the so-called slacker mandate. Uh, for kids up to age 26, their parents uh, can enroll them in their existing plan. And so you sort of look at this catalog and what do you see? You see a dominance of opt-in strategies. The default is set to non-participation uh, and various carrots and sticks to try and motivate opt-in. So the, you know, the, the obvious uh, response to this might be, well, first of all, that's odd. If you're behaviorally sophisticated, why have you structured the entire thing as opt-in rather than opt-out? There were obviously political and constitutional constraints that were important factors in that uh, calculation. Uh, but the other sort of interesting issue is, well, if they're all structured as opt-ins, did they work or did they not? Because if there's variability in how each of these opt-ins worked, life has got to be more complicated than opt-ins don't work and opt-outs do work. There may be specific factors that you ought to need to pay attention to. Uh, so what were the effects? Well, 17 states in the District of Columbia created exchanges. That's you know, roughly a third of the possibility. Uh, there are 8 million claimed enrollments. There are some issues with how many have actually paid. Uh, lots of controversy about that. How many were previously uninsured? There's also issues with the mix of people who enrolled. Um, but that appears to be the claimed results. On the Medicaid expansion, roughly half the states uh, opted in, uh, so significantly higher than uh, doing the exchanges. And about uh, 3 million people, uh, we see an increase in Medicaid enrollment of 3 million, although some of that is in states that didn't participate in the expansion, and so you really should back those out if you're trying to figure out what the incremental impact was. The CLASS Act got killed because it was actuarially unsustainable. That means we were worried a lot about opt-in by a non-representative mix, as Dr. Garber just talked about. Uh, the people who were going to make claims were going to opt in, and other people weren't. The employer mandate's been deferred, uh, and the coverage of those 26 and under seems to have worked very smoothly. Uh, there was a claim that uh, we got an expansion of 3 million. There's some controversy about that figure as well. Uh, we can talk about those in the Q&A if people are interested. So long story short, the coverage defaults had fairly variable impacts to the extent you can actually get decent data, and that's an important limitation here. And so the questions I want you to ask yourself are up there. Is 35% of the states and 8 million enrollments a success or a failure? How much do we think would have been changed by flipping the default? It would have made a difference in some states, certainly, where there's political division, but in other states, it wouldn't have made a big difference. The enrollments issue is probably quite different uh, within the exchanges. Same set of questions for the Medicaid expansion. I already talked about the CLASS Act. We have no idea what the impact of the employer mandate is going to be. Uh, and the coverage of those under 26, it's hard to tell, right? We don't know what the denominator is, but the most striking thing is how smoothly everything went. So the core question that you ought to ask yourself, and it has implications for how broadly or narrowly you think about 
the effectiveness of choice architecture is how much of a difference would it have made if we'd flipped the default in these areas, if we set aside all of the political and constitutional objections. So a couple of policy implications. The paper, somewhat snidely, that would be me, uh, says nudges work except when they don't. That's not much of a theory as it happens, right? It doesn't really tell us when we should use nudges and when we shouldn't. Um, we need a better theory of nudging. Uh, there's lots of post hoc rationalization and just so stories in this area. That may be unavoidable given the knowledge base, but that's actually an argument to improve the knowledge base. We need better empirical evidence about why, when, and where nudges work and when they don't work. And there have been very nice studies, some of them have been presented, of individual examples of nudges. Uh, but I think we need to do some more meta work on what are the attributes of nudges that actually are sticky versus slippery, as opposed to these uh, ad hoc stories. Uh, the the uh, next issue, and here's where I, re I really push Tom, uh, was arguments about, uh, I think it's important that we be modest uh, and use good judgment in how we uh, implement these things. So one of the questions for law professors is how much of the enthusiasm for behavioral law and economics has to do with hostility to the prescriptions of neoclassical uh, law and economics, right? They, they were just looking for something to push back. It's not because they felt the need for a better theory of human behavior. They just didn't like what neoclassical law and economics was telling. The regulatory guidance problem is, you know, pl platonic guardians are in short supply no matter how high the demand. And so you ought to worry about the people who are designing the nudges, whether they have the necessary information, whether they're taking account of the factors they should and shouldn't. Are they really aiming at the interests of the people that they're regulating? Or do they just have their own interests, which they're trying to implement because it's their view of a good society? And trust me, if you don't think there's variation in what people's view of a good society is, go hang out with some libertarians, and then go hang out with some public health people. If you can't tell the difference, you're not paying attention. Um, and I think part of the, the challenge here, and I'm not uh, directing this at anyone that's spoken so far, uh, but uh, the, the sort of broader atmospherics around nudging, uh, is there's lots of interest, lots of enthusiasm. A lot of people have drunk the Kool-Aid. Uh, I think what we need is closer to what James Q. Wilson wrote uh, in his uh, very important book, Bureaucracy, which I encourage you all to read if you haven't already, uh, is at the end of a very big book about the structure of the United States government. Uh, he has, his closing section is entitled, A Few Modest Suggestions That May Make a Small Difference. And maybe that's what we ought to be trying for in this space rather than a grand improvement all at once that will reflect the perfect world we're hoping for. Um, finally, I think, uh, Nudgers ought to learn to take no for an answer. Because until they do, there's no libertarian and libertarian paternalism. If you nudge people and they persist in doing something different, if all you do is retool and take another crack at them, you're not really being libertarian. You're just being paternalistic. Let's drop the marketing uh, and focus on the fact that shove may turn out to be the new nudge. So uh, last, almost last set of slide. Maybe nudgers, or I call them nudgers, uh, should have to issue a disclosure statement to go along with each nudge. And it would be unfortunate if the disclosure statement looked like this. <laughs> Chump, if you choose what I think is best for you, then I will respect your choice. Otherwise, I will figure out a way to get you to choose what I want you to choose. Aren't you glad I'm respecting your right to choose? And the last point uh, is maybe legal academics enthusiasm for nudges is just another behavioral bias uh, that we ought to de-bias them of. So I'll leave you with this final slide, which was an Onion article from 2003, Americans demanding the government protect them from themselves. Uh, and the last, last line is, it's not just about Americans eating too many fries or cracking their skulls open when they fall off their bicycles. It's a financial issue. I spend all my money on trendy clothes and a nightlife that I can't afford. I'm $23,000 in debt, but the credit card companies keep letting me spend. It's obscene that the government allows these companies to allow me to do this to myself. Why do I pay my taxes? So 11 years later, how close are we to that? Thank you very much. We can leave the whiskey up there if we want to. <laughs> and the hamburgers.
I think I prefer the whiskey. Hello, everyone. Let's... Sorry. Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Okay. I'm used to walking around a lot when I, when I talk, so this is going to be difficult, but uh, I will persevere. Uh, I thank Glenn and the rest of the team for inviting me and setting up this wonderful conference. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm, that follows up the, the first paper very well, I think, is that um, I wrote a book last year called The Manipulation of Choice, in which I present a general critique of nudges. And when I saw the call for papers for this conference, talking about healthcare nudges in particular, it made me think if my critiques that I presented in my book also applied to the case of healthcare, or if there were some special circumstances surrounding health and healthcare that would either negate those objections or may overwhelm the objections. So I went into this project and the, the, the abstract I submitted to the conference was in that spirit, just wondering if maybe the general critiques I presented were fine in normal cases, quote unquote, but not in the case of health and healthcare. So what I'm gonna to do today in my short time is I'm going to very briefly summarize the critiques from my book and then I'm going to, uh, as, as Professor Sunstein said, kind of march uphill and present my best estimation of the arguments for healthcare nudges and then explain why I still don't think they counteract the objections. So first, to clarify, because I think the term gets tossed around a little bit and is sometimes imprecise. When I talk about nudges, I'm talking about rearrangements of the choice architecture that are meant to guide people to make better choices judged by their own interests. So I'm not talking about incentives which operate on a very conscious level. I'm not talking about interventions that are meant to promote public policy ends such as minimizing traffic congestion or increasing organ donation. I'm talking about the, the, the paternalism with a capital P when we talk about nudges. So just to make clear, that's what I'm talking about today. In my book, I, I categorize my objections to nudge in three ways. And the first way is definitely the most important one. The, the first objection is an epistemic one, and it's one that's come up several times today, so it's, it's not going to be new to anybody. That's the sense in which the, the claim to be steering our choices and our own interests is impossible because there's no way that the designers of nudges can know what our true interests are. Okay, usually a, an interest is chosen such as retirement savings or such as some measure of health and then choices are nudged in that direction, but that is not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily represent the actual true interests of any individual being subject to the nudge. Uh, even if we take an informed desire account, that's still problematic because who was actually doing the adjustment to make them informed desires. Without knowledge of anyone's particular interests, a nudge can't modify them. Um, I, I take the view, it, it may be controversial, that humans' interests are multifaceted, they are complex, and they are balanced in various different ways in different situations. This is a, an extreme reaction to the economic assumption that people are usually pursuing one goal, whether that's utility, whether that's wealth maximization, whatever it is, I think that's misguided as a, as a critical economist. That's something I pursue in my work. But I think that has led the people in policy that want to change behavior to assume that people's interests are very simplistic and singular, and I think that's the main problem here. Uh, the second problem, which stems from the first one, is an ethical problem. Okay, Once you realize that you can't know people's actual interests, how are those interests getting there? Those interests are imposed on people. Now, I am not, I'm not a public choice person. I'm not assuming that is done for improper ends. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'll readily concede that the people designing nudges are doing so in, with the best of intentions, but they're still imposing some idea of interests on people in substitution of their true interests. And this ends up guiding their choices in a direction that is not what they would choose and is therefore a, a danger to autonomy, okay? Uh, third, the, the practical, there's actually several practical problems with nudges, but the one that the previous talk is a great lead into is the, the problem that as I defined it at the beginning of my talk, that nudges are meant to improve choices in people's own estimation of their interests, that can't be done. 
Again, because policymakers have no direct knowledge of those interests. I'm, I'm, not, I'm no Pollyanna, trust me. I do not claim that any of us have perfect information about our own interests. Okay, our own interests are relatively opaque to us. Okay, we can't list them out just like the economist fiction that you can list out your preference ranking. But still, I maintain that as, as imperfectly as we know our own interests, we still know them better than anyone else outside our close circle of family and friends do. Okay, so any designer of a choice intervention claiming to steer our choices in our own interests, again, with the best of intentions, is, is not going to do that by definition. Okay, so the question of whether nudges work, they, they work in that they, they are very well designed to produce the behavior they were designed to produce, but are they actually benefiting the true interests of the people being nudged? I have to say there's no way we can know that, which obviously limits cost-benefit analysis of nudges in general. So that, that's very brief and very concise and somewhat skips over a lot of detail from my book. Um, let me do the uphill march in Professor Sunstein's terms and talk about why health might provide an exemption to these objections. And it was very hard to find this in the literature. It was very hard to find explicit statements of this. Um, so I, I tried to infer to the best that I could possible uh, justifications or defenses. And they basically fall into two areas. One is the, the tremendous importance of health. Okay, the fact that health is an important interest to almost everybody, or we should just say everybody. Okay, it's not always a, a intrinsic interest, it's more of an instrumental interest. It allows us to pursue our other ends, our other goals, our other interests, but it is an indispensable one, okay? Second is the difficulty argument, which we've heard several times here today, okay, including from the provost's uh, plenary. And that is the fact that choices in healthcare, even more so than, say, financial choices, are tremendously difficult and tremendously complicated. Okay, we can think of at least three reasons for this. One is they're extremely technical. Okay, doctors use terms that are over most of our heads. Okay, they're, they've got assessments of risks that we don't know where they came from, and they try to transmit this to us, but there's no way we can make these decisions on our own. Okay? Second, these are often emotionally wrought decisions. Okay, these are often life and death matters. Okay, they're decisions which, which affect uh, integrally our bodily and mental autonomy, okay? And third, um, excuse me, the, these decisions often have to be in, implemented over time, okay? Another thing we heard today from, the, from just the, the, the plenary is that a lot of healthcare actions have to be taken over time. You have to follow drug regimens, you have to follow exercise programs. We may start out with the best of intentions, but weakness of will eventually takes over for many of us. We heard that diabetes treatments are, are much more effective when they're simpler and when they don't have to be done at as small intervals, okay? So those are all great reasons, and I'm not going to dispute any of them as, as far as the nature of healthcare decisions. What I am going to dispute, though, is that they have any real impact on my arguments against nudges in general. Um, let me take them in, in turn. The interest objection, you know, the idea that health is an important, or if not a, a, a critical interest of each living person, is true. But it's not our only interest. It's not necessarily the most important interest. Okay? We balance the health interests with many of our other interests. Okay, even a, even a health nut, which I'm not, no surprise, uh, does not make every decision in sole light of his or her health interests. Okay, we balance our health. I try to be a generally healthy person, but I don't have that at the forefront of my mind when I make all decisions, and I don't think I should. I have many interests, which I balance in different situations, and that leads me to make different decisions in different situations, not necessarily the decision that a medical professional or a health policy expert would have me make. Uh, second, not only is health not our only or most important interest, but also we all have different conceptions of health. We all have different goals in terms of health. For instance, some of us may be focused on weight loss. Some of us may be focused on strength development. Some of us may be focused on having good skin. They're all valid health goals. Many of us try to pursue many of these goals, which again, we balance in different ways at different times. Okay, so any well-intentioned policy uh, 
initiative to increase health is both going to potentially ignore the other valid interests that people have, as well as miss their precise definitions of health. So again, it's the same interest objection that as well-intentioned as, as nudge designers are, they don't know the actual interests of the people who are being nudged. Um, second, this also obviously influences the difficulty argument. Again, I do not contest that medical decisions are extremely difficult and emotional and hard to follow over time. But this doesn't uh, justify sort of nudging people into certain decisions that medical professionals think are best. Okay, medical professionals value autonomy for the right reasons. They should do everything they can to inform they can suggest what the, what the person should do, but eventually the choice has to be up to the person, him or herself, whether it's a patient or whether it's someone subject to health policies, et cetera, okay? As, as with any decision, information is critical, guidance is critical, counsel is critical, but unless the medical professional or the policy expert knows the precise interests of the person they're advising, they can't make the decision for them and they shouldn't presume to make that decision for them and then nudge the person in that direction. Okay. So that's my, my sort of response to the two arguments for health nudges that I, that I came up with inferring from the literature. I found when I was done that not only did I think that these reasons were not sufficient to overwhelm my objections to nudges, I actually thought they reinforced them in the sense that the fact that health is such an important interest to all of us is, is a stronger argument against nudges because health involves our bodily and our mental autonomy. Okay, this is, this is one of the most critical areas that the law, if not morality, protects autonomy to the greatest extent. Okay, so I think that argues for making sure that, that patients or consumers of health products are even more involved in that decision making at a conscious, deliberate level to whatever extent they can. Again, I don't have any idealistic view of human rationality and autonomy, but in health cases especially, more so than say choosing a mortgage or a life insurance plan, the, the stakes are high enough but I think they, they, they're high and they argue against nudges to the fact that health decisions are so intrinsically personal and people's interests ought to be protected more. And even though these are difficult decisions, one of, one of the dimensions of, of difficulty I mentioned was emotionality. They're emotional decisions specifically because they're so intensely personal. So uh, I hope I may have convinced some of you. I didn't get any Alito, you know, shaking the head, so I guess that, that's lucky. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's it. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm very excited and delighted to be here in such esteemed company, and I'm very grateful to the organizers for putting on such a fascinating and important conference. So I research and write on issues of inequality in food policy, examining how structural institutionalized policies have disproportional impact on politically and socially marginalized communities. In particular, I've looked at the problems that arise from the USDA being an entity charged with two conflicting tasks. One of these is the creation of the Federal Dietary Guidelines, which it puts out with the Department of Health and Human Services every five years. These guidelines are the basis of all federal nutrition programs, including school lunches, assistance to women and children, and food banks. The USDA's responsibility for good nutrition is extremely important because the United States has been in a health crisis for many years, particularly in comparison to other advanced countries. So this is a chart, for example, showing our obesity ranking as compared to 
a lot of other countries. The USDA is also responsible for the health of United States agriculture. In this role, it must ensure a demand for the commodities that the government chooses to subsidize, including corn, milk, soy, and wheat that matches the supply created by these subsidies. It therefore also has an interest in the industries that provide that demand, including soft drinks and fast and processed foods. Sorry if I'm making you hungry, but since I'm after lunch, I figured it'd be okay. These industries have a complementary interest in maintaining positive relationships with the federal government to ensure minimum regulation of harmful food additives they commonly use in their products and continued subsidization of their products' primary ingredients. Eric Biber writes that multitask agencies will prioritize the tasks that are easiest to measure and come with the most incentives. The amount of subsidized commodities sold is a lot easier to measure than nutritional outcomes, which can be hard to isolate from other contributing factors. Also, political donations, well-funded lobbying, and a revolving door between industry and government all create significant incentives for the USDA to prioritize subsidies that allow fast and processed food companies to sell their products at artificially low costs. One way that the USDA demonstrates that it prioritizes supporting subsidized commodities over improving health outcomes is the different methods it uses to accomplish these goals. For example, 30 years of warnings in the federal dietary guidelines to avoid high-fat milk created a large surplus that the USDA had to dispose of. To do so, it created a marketing branch called DMI through a dairy farmer's checkoff program. DMI partnered with fast food companies to create and advertise new products that contain significantly greater amounts of cheese than other products. One of these is Domino's American Legends Seven Cheese Pizza Line. DMI kicked off the advertising campaign for this new product in the Super Bowl 2009. Other DMI created products include Taco Bell's Steak Quesadilla and Pizza Hut's Cheesy Bites Pizza. More pizza talk. <laughs> so DMA also created the award-winning Got Milk ad campaign featuring celebrities with milk mustaches that just ended a very successful 20-year run. This type of marketing is expensive and effective. Not surprisingly, high numbers of Americans continue to suffer from the deaths and diseases associated with the overconsumption of saturated fats that prompted the dietary guidelines to warn against this 30 years ago. In contrast, the USDA's efforts to increase consumption of healthy foods focus on behavioral economics. The agency funds research done at Cornell University on how behavioral economics, or nudging, can be introduced into lunchrooms and other federal food programs to steer people towards healthier choices. The other main government strategy to improve health has been through nutritional labeling in restaurants and on packages and new improved labels will be required beginning next year. The problem with this focus on nudging and information provision is that food preferences tend to be sticky. In other words, many studies have shown that these techniques simply don't work in the food context. And some of these strategies may actually make things worse. For example, a study of nutritional labeling in Starbucks showed that consumers who read nutritional information often will choose a lower calorie main meal like a sandwich or salad, but then they add an unhealthy item to their meal like a dessert or a special coffee. So in the end, their overall purchase is less healthy than what they would have chosen without the nutritional information. Another study showed that the addition of a healthy item to a menu, which is relatively unhealthy, say burgers and fries, actually leads to less healthy selections because the consumer's need to be healthy is vicariously fulfilled just by the presence of the salad on the menu. Other studies show that both adults and teenagers do notice nutritional information in restaurants,
but neither group tends to alter its choices as a result. So the consensus among researchers seems to be that labeling only affects people like me, who are already obsessed with food and what's in it, and who are not the target group of people who need to make significant changes to their eating habits. The Cornell studies have revealed that behavioral economics provides helpful insights into how to influence people to make better food choices. For example, selecting food in advance instead of at the point of purchase helps people avoid problems with impulsivity and self-control. Making fruit the default instead of fries leads to more fruit choices because we tend to value what we have more than what we could acquire. Giving people a debit card to purchase healthy food while taking only cash for unhealthy selections also leads to healthier choices because of the ease of purchase with a card. All of these findings are helpful, although they have not yet been widely implemented or required. But there are limits to the usefulness of nudging because the true causes of poor health are not bad choices that can be fixed through the manip manipulation of cognitive processes that behavioral economics does so well. Instead, the causes are structural. They're about the availability and cost of healthy food and the way these structural factors reduce or eliminate choice. The USDA's policy of using behavioral economics to improve health while employing stronger tactics to sell subsidized commodities has a disparate impact on communities who suffer the most from food-related diseases and deaths. These charts are a little hard to read, but the gray area is African-American. You see it dominates for heart disease. This is cancer incidence. African-American is the second one. Cancer death rates. Again, you see black as the second. Diabetes. Uh, Pacific Islanders here dominate, but, um, and this is high blood pressure. So for example, DMI's introduction of surplus cheese into fast food products has the greatest effect on communities whose diets are dominated by fast food. These include urban centers populated by low-income African American and Latinos, and islands like Puerto Rico and Hawaii, where federal government policy has discouraged agriculture. These communities have very little, if any, access to the political process that they could use to influence USDA policy. They also tend to consume the most packaged and processed foods, which contain additives like potassium bromate, a chemical that decreases baking time. This chemical has been linked to kidney damage, cancer, and damage to the nervous system. It's banned in Europe, Canada, and China. In the United States, it's a common ingredient in packaged wraps, rolls, and flatbreads. Another food additive, butylated hydroxytoluene, or BHT, is linked to tumors and cancers. It's banned in Japan, United Kingdom, and many other European countries, but it's probably in the cereal you ate every morning, even healthy ones like cashew. It can also be found in packaged nuts, gum, butter, and meat, and the food dye used in this cereal also leads to brain cancer, nerve cell deterioration, and hyperactivity. Though many of the products that contain these and other harmful additives feature prominently in school lunchrooms and food banks. In many ways, food policy appears to favor industry over consumer, particularly poor consumers of color. The USDA should shift its priorities, putting health over industry. Instead of funding research into behavioral economics to facilitate incremental improvements in food choice, it should focus on making healthy food universally available. It should regulate harmful food additives and mandate healthy school lunches without compromising with food companies. Fast food should not be in schools. The USDA should also reevaluate which commodities it chooses to subsidize from a health perspective that emphasizes vegetables and fruits and with an eye to the market to avoid wasteful surpluses. While I appreciate behavioral economics contributions to the important project of strengthening individuals' capacities to make better choices, its role in food policy should be very limited until structural changes are put in place to expand choices for everyone.
you can see why we had Andrea speak after lunch. So we'll have people queue up. Uh, you know, I, I will observe that being against milk and Sofia Vergara is like the 21st century uh, version of being against mom and apple pie. Um, I've got a question. Why don't we take questions in tranches? So we'll take mine, we'll take yours, and then we'll help, let people answer. Um, my question is for uh, Mark, uh, potentially also for David, for anybody who really wants to answer it. Uh, and that is, again, this question of health exceptionalism. So if I were trying to construct a defense as to why nudges in health make more sense than maybe other domains, I think I would play on, and this may be more true in universal healthcare societies, the level of interdependence of healthcare choices as, a lo as the idea that the state may have more of a justification for manipulation because of that. And then maybe also something like uh, what Tim Scanlon says, you know, you may derive more welfare from having uh, uh, sacrifices be made to your God than you do from universal health care, but that doesn't mean that you have an obligation to demand that the state owes you those sacrifices, right? So we think that maybe a claim for the special importance of health care turns on what the state owes you, and maybe that's different from other kinds of domains. I'm curious about that. But let's also take another question, and then we can have answers to both. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, this question. Uh, David Did you say your name first? Yeah, David Tannenbaum, UCLA. Uh, this question I, I think is mainly directed at Mark, but but maybe uh, Glenn as well. Which is, um, it's clear you don't like nudges, but it wasn't clear what your what you preferred or what the alternative was. And and the reason why I ask that is because um, <clears throat> you know part of the argument is that there's just no way to stand back and respect preferences, right? That we know that people's preferences are partly constructed on the fly. How you ask the question, how you elicit the response is gonna have an effect. So there's just no way to kind of get around choice architecture, so to speak. So I was wondering if you could comment on that and you know, if, if you're anti-nudge, what's the alternative? Take this. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I've, I've heard several times today about the inevitability of nudges and I definitely have an approach to that. Uh, it, it's, it's one thing to say that you can't avoid affecting choice in very subtle, kind of under the radar, system one kind of ways. But you can control how you nudge them and the intent behind the, the choice architecture is what makes it paternalistic or not. Uh, in, in my book, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to keep promoting my book, but in my book, I... I Watch it I, on Amazon? Okay. <laughs> put the link. They'll the send link. it to you automatically. Okay. I didn't. <laughs> Oh, really? Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, no, but I mean, the point is I, I, I take Sunstein and Taylor's cafeteria example and the options they show for how the foods could be re rearranged, and I show how there's additional options that aren't either paternalistic or absurd. There are options that, that could be culturally be based. There are options that could be, you know, according to aesthetic pleasure of the orientation of the foods. I mean, there are many options. It's, it's the paternalist there's a paternalism What's in the What's the name of the book, Mark? <laughs> what? Name of the oh, book. Oh, jeez. It's a marketing opportunity here. What's the name of the book? Oh, God. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you the name of the book. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to tell your publisher you said that. Go ahead. <laughs> That's a nod. So, so I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, I, I guess you won't be surprised that I would say just leave the choices up to the people, and you know, you, you, you know, in the health case in particular, give them information, but try to give them information in the most neutral way you can, without, you know, consciously nudging them one way or the other. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I generally agree with that. I might add, though, that there's no necessity that the government do particular things, right? So it's, we've made a choice to have the government involved, at which point there are choice architecture issues that follow. But if the government isn't involved, other people may be making choice architecture decisions, but it's not the government. And for reasons I think Sunstein laid out, um, you might have very different concerns about market participants who are subject to market discipline and have other dynamics going on than a single centralized government or 50 competing governments. So I just add that to the intent dynamic. Hi, uh, my name is Amit Serpatwari from Harvard Medical School. I have a question for Professor White. Just um, about the concept of, I think you make a very valid point that oh, the, the importance of the higher stakes of autonomy in, med in medicine. I, I'm also just curious though, what about the higher stakes of potential errors and of 
in that respect, also the higher the complexity of the information involved. If you could just talk about, is it just the fact that the autonomy overrides in that instance, in your opinion? Okay, good good question, and maybe I didn't elaborate on this enough. I, I think the role of of the the doctor or the nutritionist or whatever medical professional is advising people is is integral. I mean, it's it's indispensable, but you know the 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 doctor can only do so much. And, and I think if the stakes are that high and the costs of error are that great, the doctor can convey that to the patient. And I have to imagine, I'm obviously not a medical professional, but I have to imagine the vast majority of cases, I mean, if my doctor told me, you need this to live or you're gonna die, I, I would, I mean, I, you know, I, I realize not everyone would, but I, I think it's incumbent on the doctor and the trust relationship between the doctor and the patient should enhance this that the doctor can convey the stakes to the patient well enough without having to nudge the patient. Because, I mean, even if in the small astronomical chance that the, the patient would go against the orders, that's, that's what the patient wants. And we may not be able to imagine why, but again, it's not for us to judge the choices. It's us for, to try to provide guidance and information and, and maybe even persuasion, but, but still not not nudging, not that kind of under the radar influence. So let me push on, follow up this question and push my own question a little bit further again, is that if, you know, if we're in a state where we believe that there's a right to healthcare, right, so there is this relationship between the state and us as to healthcare that's kind of special, doesn't it seem more plausible that the state can use the weakest piece of its arsenal, choice architecture? I mean, isn't that something that distinguishes the health case perhaps from other places where we don't have this duty rights relationship? Uh, you, you hit a landmine there because I, I, I would dispute your, your premise in that we have a special relationship there. Because obviously the, 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 the public, the nature of the, the public health regime influences this is a lot. Because like, you know, Peter Orzag's original comments where he hyped behavioral economics uh, emphasized primarily on the costs and are there ways we can use behavioral economics to lower the costs of health care. And that's not paternalistic, that's policy. Then only at the end of the talk did he say, we also want to improve health. Okay, so that's, that in, even when you improve health, this is one thing that I don't understand why libertarian paternalists do, except from a pure marketing view standpoint, is since in my opinion, you can't know what people's interests are to actually help them make choices in their own interests, but you've decided that health is an interest or retirement savings is an interest. I mean, that, that basically betrays an objective theory of value, which is defensible. I don't see why they don't just pursue that and say, we think health is an objective good, and we're going to take certain measures to promote it without this pretense that we're helping you pursue your own interests when the state has no idea what those are. But. So just, just a quick show of hands. How many people think health care is special? Just raise your hands. Come on, be honest. I would expect 100%, given the nature of this conference. Now, how many people think if I asked a group of farmers whether agriculture was special, they would get 100% of them? And at a meeting of the NRA, how many people would say Second Amendment rights are special? And so on and so on, right? So the core problem is everybody wants to think their, their area is exceptional. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, if everything's, to quote the Incredibles, if everything is special, nothing is. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, the more fundamental difficulty, though, is, yeah, markets don't work perfectly in all sorts of ways, and in healthcare especially so. But then the question is, where do you go from there, right? And you need to think about error costs and decision costs, as we heard out already, and just saying it's special and we ought to be able to do what we want because people really care about health when lots of the things they do indicate they don't care as much about health as the kind of people that show up at conferences to talk about how special healthcare is think it is, <laughs> then you might want to reconsider your priors. Of course, not everybody's right about how special their area is. We have two in the <laughs> Let's take two together. Yes, so um, I have two very quick questions, one for uh, Mark, the other for Andrea. Uh, so Mark, your talk was about uh, the ethics of nudging in healthcare, but you mostly focused on health policy and population level nudges. What about personalized and tailored nudges that are done in the clinical uh, healthcare setting? Uh, are they impermissible as well? 
because the epistemic uh, issue is different there. A physician and a patient can know each other uh, quite well. Uh, and my question for Andrea is, is the following one. Uh, it seems to me that you pointed out a problem with the ethics of researcher, uh, researchers and not the ethics of nudging. That is, to what extent can behavioral economists, for example, lobby in favor of their own research agenda and questions and policies to the detriment of other approaches that seem legitimate as well. Uh, and I'd like to hear your, your views about that. So hold your answer and we'll get the next question in also. Uh, Steve Helfer, Harvard Law School Library, retired. Uh, for about 40 years, the medical profession nudged women to get hormone replacement therapy. Uh, likewise, for many decades, uh, they nudged people to avoid saturated fat. That's been called into question recently. Likewise, they called uh, people to eat more fruits and vegetables as a possible uh, preventative for cancer. That has become uh, discredited. Uh, my question is, uh, how much should policymakers be wary of researchers overstating their uh, case for these different interventions? Andrea, why don't you start with the question to you? So, uh, you disappeared. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, the, uh, oh, start with that question? Wait, no, no, okay. Oh. The first, I'm starting the first question first, which was about the ethics of lobbying by behavioral I see you. economists. I, I don't think the ethics question belongs in the hands of the behavioral, as, as you know, we have just had pointed out, everyone's going to lobby for their own interests, and I wouldn't think too much about the ethics of doing that, but about the ultimate choice, right? Why do the behavioral econo economists get the money, right, instead of other interests? And there, you know, it might be the prominence, the, the institutions, and the fashionability of it all, and again, the lack of political power by other groups who suffer from those choices. Thanks for your question. <laughs> and the second question, um, remind me. People make mistakes. Me. Oh, well. Data's not insufficient or inadequate. Yes. But for example, the saturated fats. Yes, we had one study that came out that said we, maybe saturated fats is in the problem. But we have hundreds and hundreds of studies that said, yes, it is. Right? So yes, research changes, things change, but I think we can even intuitively understand that it is better to promote fruits and vegetables than soft drinks and Big Macs, right? So yes, there are areas of gray and we need to be flexible and open to change, but I think some policies are fairly easy to find the right path to go down. And the, the answer your your question about the clinical framework, you, you make a good point, and I forgot to mention this, is that often between a physician and a patient, there, there is a care relationship, at least from the physician to the patient, not necessarily the other way around. But, you know, and that care does involve a, a more intense no, uh, knowledge of interests than, say, just someone you stop in the clinic for, for a shot once a year. So in that sense, the, the, the physician does have much more knowledge of interests. But also, that, that has to be counterbalanced with the trust relationship. I mean, we heard the provost talk about the, the trust relationship between a physician and a patient, and why, doesn't the, why don't physicians take advantage of that? I heard that, and with all due respect, I thought that was self-defeating. I mean, the, they have the trust relationship because they don't take advantage of it. And I think the, the trust relationship would be compromised. And I, I read one paper, I can't remember who it was by, but there's one paper I read recently that made a big deal out of this, that, that while physicians do have the, the uh, opportunity to nudge or try, try to steer choices in one way or the other, that would actually compromise the trust relationship. But I, I think it's all towards a good end because if there is that trust relationship, the doctors are just going to be even more effective in advising the patient towards what the doctor thinks is the correct course of action, even though I still think the doctor should stop short of actually trying to steer him or nudge him in. Yeah. Why don't we take the last two questions there and we'll get answers. Apologies to people still in line, but they'll stick around for a while, so we'll take these two. 
Hi, Jeff Skopek. I'm an academic fellow at Petrie Flom. So I had a question, I guess, for Mark and David, following up on the first question of, um, which was about whether or not governments are sort of inevitably nudging. And so you both gave a different response to why we might be particularly worried or sort of a response, one way of thinking about um, that. So Mark, you mentioned uh, the role of intent and David mentioned the act of mission distinction. And it's true that both intent and act of mission we generally think of as being morally relevant, but I wonder whether or not they actually do the work uh, necessary to explain, um, or whether or not they're actually relevant for government actors. So on the question of intent, it's not clear why intent itself would be morally relevant apart from consequences when you're not talking about an individual. So theories of intent that try to say this is something relevant about intent apart from consequences, generally think of you know maybe virtue ethics, some sort of idea of character, whereas uh, sort of when you think about governments, you might not think that that would be relevant. And similarly, act omission, Sunstein in an, another sort of area of his work has actually argued that the act of mission distinction is not relevant for governments, that's a government sort of fill the void. So whether or not governments are acting or not acting um, is irrelevant and that if you think it's uh, relevant uh, that you might just think that the governments are being. So why, I guess another way, a sort of simpler way of framing this was why would we prefer for governments to be sort of careless than to acting? with intent if in either case they're going to be sort of filling the void in both um, and affecting choices. Let's get the last can, question can in. Can you put my book back up, Just get the, get the yeah. question yeah. in and then we'll have an answer for both questions. Go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Catherine Womack in the philosophy department at Bridgewater State. I'm also one of those sincere public health people. Um, so I have something, a uh, suggestion uh, for Andrea and a sort of question for Mark as well. Um, this won't quite fit on a bumper sticker, but you might uh, uh, try to solve part of the problems that Andrea brings up by suggesting do food policy uh, globally nudge locally? Um, and so we can only do what we can do. Lots of studies, for instance, lots of studies show that at food banks, people who get the food uh, throw away the cantaloupes and the kale in the dumpsters, and they actually um, are looking for you know, Wonder Bread and um, Doritos and chips. This is just replicated in lots of qualitative studies all over the place. Giving them recipe cards doesn't do anything. In, but what seems to have some effect are things like community gardens, local school gardens. These are micro <laughs> mm -hmm. programs. And they often happen, and they have some success when there's local buy-in. That is to say, when, as Yashar pointed out, the epistemic problem gets overcome when we're, in fact, in a good position to know what people's preferences are, in part because they tell us, right? So what's wrong with actually engaging in sort of micro-level, community-level nudges with local buy-in at the same time that you know we engage in the um, uh, task of trying to take down General Mills. Great, so let's start. David, if you want to start this time, or yeah, we'll go this direction. Okay, um, so just a quick general observation, right? The USDA does what it does, not because they're evil, bad, awful people who happen to work in Washington and elsewhere, but because the United States Congress has decided to uh, vote subsidies for all sorts of things, and the agency design ends up tracking what it spends its time and what its priorities are. And the sort of add-on of, gee, you might want to do some nutritional labeling was because that seemed to be a sensible place to put it. Um, and so, you know, the, the agency design issues are very interesting and problematic, um, but it's not the USDA to blame, it's us. Uh, because of the people that we've elected, the system that we have, and the resulting, you know, preference uh, in Congress for uh, agriculture over many other sectors of the economy. And if you think healthcare is special, let me tell you, agriculture is special, okay? USDA was the single most powerful agency in Washington for decades. DHS is the only entity that can give it a run for its money. Um, and that's for, you know, uh, all sorts of reasons. So that's the first point. Second point um, is, you know, the, the question that was put to me was, do you prefer the government to be careless? Now, this would be called embedding the conclusion in the premise of your question, right? No, of course I don't prefer my government to be careless. I want it to do a good job at the specific and limited things that we've decided to let it do and not give it plenary authority. Um, as for Cass's observation, about government filling the void, uh, and so the act emission distinction doesn't work. Cass is just wrong, okay? I mean, that, that's basically a philosophical assessment masquerading as a legal argument. 
Okay, I'll, I'll just pick up on the, the care less. The, I, I joked with Glenn that you should put my book back up because I actually discussed that. And, I, and even more so in a September follow-up to that book about policy is I, I don't think the government is in a position to care for us in the sense that the care ethicists use care. And I, I know there are care ethicists, and I address this, that, that think every the, the political relationship should be dominated by care. But again, I think care depends on a, a, a tremendous knowledge of interests where you know someone well enough to presume to care for them, and the government doesn't know enough about any one of us to care for us. Uh, I, again, even I'll, I'll moderate what he said a little bit, is I think the government should do what we ask them to do through the election process and the direct referendum process, tackle problems that present themselves, they, including health problems, public health problems, but I don't think they should do anything out of a motive of care because I don't think that's the proper role of government, and I realize there can be disagreement with that, of course. Okay, and um, regarding the community gardens, I completely agree with you. Uh, community gardens and listening to communities about what they need is very important, but I wouldn't characterize it as nudging. I think of that more as advocacy, um, politics, activism, and I would want that approach to transcend the local to the global, because only by listening to communities and being directly involved in communities and creating things like community gardens on a large scale will we see any change. Great, please join me in thanking this panel.